Thank you, Ben, uh, for uh, such a great uh, introduction. I'm very happy uh, to be here. As Ben mentioned, I am a PhD candidate in computer science at the uh, Blockchain Center and spe specializing in my research on intersection of uh, layer two blockchains, rollups, and decentralized finance. And today I'm going to show you how those two words actually can uh, come together for our uh, benefits. I mean, if you are not persuaded by the previous talk from Nicola, why tokenization is great, I will uh, give you some more arguments. You can see uh, behind my uh, back, actually, what was happening when it comes to tokenization of uh, US Treasury bills uh, last uh, year. Generally, last year was known as a uh, crypto winter when the TVL in uh, DeFi was at best uh, flat <laughs> with relatively low uh, trading volume. But there was one uh, asset class that was performing uh, quite well, and these were those uh, tokenized uh, uh, US Treasury bills. I mean, one of the reasons was is back then they were paying five or more uh, percent, which is far more than you can or you could make uh, from uh, staking. And what would be actually very cool if those assets could be put inside uh, DeFi uh, protocols like Aave to enable uh, some uh, leverage. It is uh, today not straightforward. straightforward. Some protocols are experimenting with it, but we hope yeah, it will come, uh, it will come uh, soon. There are the major benefits why the companies are uh, like, I mean, Accionariat and others decide to go for tokenization. It's because of the very fast uh, settlement on the blockchain, which is happening within uh, seconds compared to the days that uh, it lasts in the traditional financial uh, industry. Also, the costs are uh, relatively uh, low, especially when you are using a layer two, uh, layer two uh, blockchains. And then there is also the issue of trust. That's maybe a little uh, philosophical question, if we trust more uh, regulations or if we trust more uh, cryptography. I believe that in the future, this is where we are going. Yeah, uh, there will be no need to choose. Yeah, there will be systems that will be based on those two uh, pillars. But there is, yeah, as I mentioned to you, uh, the nice thing about the uh, decentralized finance is that we could simply think about uh, using those smart contracts behind uh, decentralized finance to uh, further boost possibilities of uh, tokenized, uh, those tokenized real-world uh, assets. So there are plenty of applications of uh, decentralized finance. I'm not going to uh, talk uh, about all of them uh, today and how they could be used uh, for tokenization, but only focus on one particular use case, which are uh, decentralized uh, exchanges. And those decentralized exchanges, like, uh, they, they function like Uniswap or a Curve. They have one uh, magical trick, uh, which is called uh, automated market makers. And simply those automated market makers, they decide uh, to whom and for how, how much uh, tokens uh, sell or buy uh, some another tokens. Like in international finance, you typically have uh, order books. You have some companies that are doing market making. They are coming. They are putting some uh, orders on that, uh, or that order book. And the traders are, in are interacting with that. Putting such order book on a decentralized finance uh, on the blockchain would be too expensive, and for that reason, though, automated market makers were, uh, were uh, invented. But one of the things, before actually we start using those automated market makers, is the question about interoperability. Because as you can see on a chart behind me, a lot of tokenization projects are actually happening on a very different, uh, very different uh, blockchain. This is just a snapshot about one particular class, which is a tokenized uh, debt. So it's not uh, representing the whole uh, class of uh, real world assets. I mean, the interesting thing is, is that mo most of tokenization is happening on the Ethereum compatible uh, chains. But still, if we want to have in the future a very, uh, very liquid and efficient market, we need to think how to uh, bridge uh, those uh, tokens uh, together to have one uh, ideally blockchain taking, taking care of that uh, interoperability and uh, bridging. 
And then there is actually another question that uh, we, uh, that actually we at the university ask uh, ourselves and uh, focus in our research, will it be really cheaper uh, in the future to buy, for example, a bond or maybe uh, to exchange uh, euro into a Swiss franc using the blockchain uh, than it is today using the traditional financial system. So we just put aside all of those um, ideological aspects of the blockchain, and then simply try, we are trying to uh, calculate what is, uh, what is cheaper. Because I mean, I believe uh, that in the future, the real blockchain adoption will come from that increased, uh, in increased uh, efficiency. efficiency. So we were actually not the, not the, not the first one that looked at uh, those topics. The interesting thing is, is that pioneers of applications of uh, smart contracts from DeFi uh, for uh, central bank digital currencies are uh, central banks, and they're already running a lot of uh, pilot projects and experiments. I just maybe mentioned the two. One is Project Mariana. The other is a Project uh, Agora. In a Project uh, Agora, simply central banks, there are like seven together with a, a, a bank for international settlement in Basel. They are trying to uh, bring all of the tokenized assets on one uh, blockchain, and they are experimenting with uh, uh, bridges. The project just started, and in the Project Mariana, simply what uh, central banks uh, central banks did, they use uh, they did a fork of uh, Curve on the Ethereum on the Ethereum uh, testnet. And they were experimenting with uh, using it to exchange uh, three uh, test uh, CBDCs, one representing digital euro, one representing digital Swiss franc, and one uh, Singaporean uh, dollar. And actually, the interesting thing is uh, it turned out that from the legal point of view, but also from the point of view of all of the processes, it is uh, possible. It is possible, and it will meet all of the requirements that the traditional finance uh, has to use those smart contract and the blockchain to move the whole uh, FX market uh, um, on the blockchain and on the uh, DeFi smart contracts. And this is a huge market because FX market alone, even not touching that tokenization, is processing seven trillion of dollars uh, daily. So you can imagine that uh, what the boost it would be to the traditional uh, DeFi if those seven trillions uh, trading volume uh, yeah, would be moved, uh, would be moved uh, there. But looking at that uh, project that actually proved that it is possible, we simply at university start asking more questions about which blockchain to use, which AMM to use, and how to parameterize them. And this is what I'm going to uh, show you in the second part of our uh, presentation. This is actually when uh, it starts to get interesting because the layer two and layer three blockchains are uh, stepping in. So I mean, as we are at the Ethereum Zurich, I will not be explaining to you what is the rollup, but I heard even during the talks uh, in the corridor that some people questioning the sense of existence of layer trees on top of the uh, rollups. And this is actually uh, what I'm presenting to you as a very good um, use case, which is showing that we really need layer trees and layer fours and five in, uh, on top of those layer twos. Because uh, layer twos and the rollups, they offer a very low uh, fees, especially after the, the Kuhn upgrade and the introduction of the uh, blobs. I mean, it went down almost to uh, one cent um, for many, many rollups, but it's still uh, far too much. If you're thinking about moving the whole financial system and the, the, our daily operations there, yeah, we need to, uh, yeah, we need to go uh, with those gas fees even farther. And this is where those uh, layer trees are becoming useful, because according to the research, uh, gas fees on each layer are around 50 times cheaper comparing to the uh, previous, uh, comparing to the previous uh, layer. So if today layer twos and rollups are offering gas fees 50 times cheaper than Ethereum mainnet, then the layer trees can offer 250 times uh, cheaper uh, gas fees. That, of course, is leading, uh, that increased scalability is leading, ding, ding, leading to the challenges of uh, uh, capital fragmentation between those, uh, between those uh, different uh, layer uh, trees. And simply, what we uh, did uh, at the, uh, in our experiment, 
we designed a such uh, decentralized exchange that is operating on uh, layer two and layer three uh, blockchains. Here you can see how that uh, decentralized exchange is actually uh, working. Uh, maybe I start from the bottom. At the very bottom, there is a public layer one blockchain, for example, uh, Ethereum, or maybe in the future, it will be uh, Bitcoin. And that uh, layer is simply a settlement layer. This is, uh, uh, this is a layer where in the future for the, uh, those tokenized assets or CBDCs will be just using as a, a data, uh, as a data uh, storage. But then what we, we're going to happen on top of that, there will be a layer two or a rollup that is responsible for integration of the uh, data from uh, another blockchains or another layer twos. And on, on top of that, you have different uh, layer threes that are operating uh, uh, decentralized finance protocols. In a, let's say, traditional computer science, which is not related to crypto, it's quite common that you have a computer program which is having different layers, like a database layer, data integration, user interface, and so on, an application layer. And simply, uh, with the more complex applications for the blockchain, we are going to see more blockchain layers. Also, uh, each blockchain layer specializing in different, uh, uh, in different uh, application. And maybe the important thing is that in our uh, simulation, this uh, layer two, this rollup, is a private rollup, because uh, sometimes it's being called validium. So uh, this is like a permissionless, uh, this is like a permission blockchain, which you can have on top of a public uh, blockchain. This is quite a new, a new and interesting concept. And even though that a permissioned uh, rollup is on the public uh, blockchain like Ethereum, it's still all of the transactions are uh, encrypted by the sequencer. And here, yeah, there are only validity proofs uh, stored in the uh, underlying layer one uh, chain. So, I mean, thanks to that approach, we can uh, combine the legal requirements that are coming from the central banks or traditional finance with all of the best things that are coming from the decentralized finance and those smart, and those smart uh, contracts. But then, you, I mean, that was a beautiful design, but will it really work in the reality as that capital will be fragmented between different uh, layer three blockchains, each operating different uh, DeFi uh, protocols and AMMs? We simply uh, run a simulation and we look at the uh, FX uh, market. We look at those uh, three currencies that were chosen by the uh, central banks, euros, free strengths, and Singaporean and dollar, and simply uh, calculated how much it would cost uh, to uh, exchange uh, those uh, three currencies uh, using the blockchain and using automated uh, market makers. There are some uh, benefits coming from that. Maybe such a future FX market will be open 24-7. Uh, there will be a very low uh, gas fees. All trans transactions will be uh, settled automatically. Uh, but uh, the cost of such, doing such swaps will, be, uh, will change, uh, depending on the FX rate. This is maybe not too nice property of automated market makers, which is called a price impact or a slippage. So typically, like in IT and computer science, we are fixing one problem, but we are creating uh, another uh, problem. In other, also, in our simulation, we use uh, the... Uh, we simply convert our solution, which is running on the three layer trees, with uh, one DEX, which is a fork of a curve, running only on one, uh, uh, on one blockchain, for example, on Ethereum. And that blockchain is not having the uh, capital fragmentation. And here you can see the results of that uh, simulation. So, I mean, for the very small uh, transactions, when you are converting, for example, a five euro into a three strengths, then the system which is operating on layer two uh, blockchains is simply far more cheaper than a uh, system of running on the layer one chain. It's a similar thing actually is happening for the largest transactions that are yeah, above uh, one million. However, for the medium-sized transactions, around yeah, maybe 10,000 euros being converted to another, another, another currencies, according to our simulation, 
let's say the results were, uh, were very uh, similar for both uh, systems. You can see the breakdown of those uh, fees uh, here. Maybe it's important to know that when you are using the uh, blockchain for, uh, I mean, that should also apply, it's not only for uh, tokenized assets and CBDCs, but for every uh, token, also, yeah, uh, meme coins. When you are using the uh, Uniswap or Curve, you have different, uh, your fee uh, is coming from a different elements. This is, of course, a gas fee, yeah, which is paid to the uh, yeah, Ethereum or a rollup. But uh, there is also a so-called swap fee or uh, LP fee, which is going to the liquidity provider, uh, to the automated market maker. And there is that slippage and the price impact, which is that inherent uh, property of the, um, of the automated market makers. And we simply uh, break down all of those fees for the uh, DEX, which is running on layer one and on the layer twos. And you can see especially that the gas fees are yeah, uh, much, much lower on the layer twos. And also the slippage actually is much lower for the largest, and, uh, yeah, for, for the largest uh, transactions. And then you can think why there is such a weird property that the... Um, that such a system is actually outperforming the smallest and the largest uh, transaction. And the reason is uh, there is no perfect automated market maker yet. I mean, all of the automated market makers that are there, there are good in some uh, cases, like Uniswap uh, V3 is good to uh, trade uh, token pairs uh, where the volatility is not too big, uh, but you need to rebalance the pool very often and pay gas fees for that. Curve V2 is good for um, uh, trading stable coins back to the same coin and uh, so uh, to the same target and so on. But when you uh, build a system which is actually uh, using one AMM for one type of the tokens, another AMM for another pool of the tokens, then you can achieve a very good, uh, very good results. And I mean, this is important because you can see that when you are running a DEX on those uh, L2s and L3s, uh, then actually the majority of the cost is coming from the slippage. Here in the green, uh, this is actually the part of the fee which is going to the liquidity provider. Gas fees on L1, almost no on L2, but the slippage is actually very big. And the slippage is coming from the parameterization of those automated uh, market makers and their uh, choice. What actually we are thinking right now at the university is how to apply the uh, artificial intelligence and the deep learning to minimi minimize that uh, steepage cost. Because uh, this is actually uh, also very important. Uh, there is and there will be actually different AMM for a different uh, tokenized assets. So we are going to use different AMM uh, to trade uh, tokenized equities, different AMM with a different parameterization for uh, tokenized uh, equities, bonds, and uh, so on. And maybe the last thing is, we're also organizing a site event uh, to the Ethereum Zurich, which is going to take place on Monday afternoon, uh, also the University of Zurich, but not at this campus in the uh, city center, and you are very welcome uh, to join. We are going to have um, a lot of Swiss banks. We are going to have the founder of Curve, also some VCs. So it will, it will be a few hours talking only about uh, DeFi. And then, thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, super interesting. Questions from the audience? Let's head straight into that. Everybody's stunned, <laughs> pretty much, I see. Super interesting. Oh, here we've got one. Yes, thank you, <clears throat> Christoph, uh, for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, what is your view on, you know, there are layer one, layer two, layer three. There are the sequences between. Is there not a risk that these sequences can be compromised and then nothing will work? Or what is your view on, on the security side, on the whole thing? Because there are a lot of small contracts involved in different layers. So what is your view on this? 
Yes, that's actually a very good, uh, very good question about the sequencers. So I don't think there is a security risk coming from, especially that uh, the nice thing about those rollups is this is already a tested technology because there are public rollups like Arbitrum CK Sync that are already there and we know it's working. However, what will come from layer two and layer three will be uh, delayed in finality because yeah, you will have to wait before until yeah, each layer will uh, settle. And that might yeah, create some, uh, some risks that needs to be uh, researched. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, so there may be just one word from my side. Really, Christoph has an amazing um, uh, sub stack where you can subscribe. He's crazy, like publishing every, literally every day, a new article. I don't know where's your private life or anything. <laughs> like, you read these stories, are really and super interesting. Like, this depth is not just the shallow and repeating what is out there. He's really challenging new stuff. So, well done. And thanks very much for the speech today. And uh, put your hands together once again for Chris. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks.